Welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. We interview remarkable and thought-provoking guests about innovation, leadership, and change in the world of business. Whether you're an executive or an entrepreneur, our objective is to help you and your organization create an entrepreneurial culture, become more innovative, and better able to respond to change. Each week, we'll deconstruct world-class performance from the arenas of business, academia, science, and sports. Each week, you can expect key insights, fresh perspectives, and proven tools you can use straight away to make you more successful professionally and personally. With your hosts, Mark Bidwell and Roddy Miller. Welcome back to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. I hope you enjoyed last week's show where Roddy talked to Steve Souza about the science of possibility. With me this week is Whitney Johnson, ex-Wall Street analyst, founder of an investment firm alongside Clayton Christensen, and author of several books. In the conversation, we talk about disruption at the personal level and how to take advantage of compounding to accelerate your learning, your development, and your career. You'll learn how to identify what you do really well, your unfair advantage, if you like. And for the resource-constrained entrepreneur or executive, and let's face it, we never have enough time or money for the job at hand. She explains really clearly how to convert these constraints into opportunities for breakthrough. Both her book, Disrupt Yourself, and this conversation have had a profound effect on how I look at both personal and organizational innovation. I think you'll enjoy it very much. Okay, so welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem podcast. Today's guest is Whitney Johnson. Whitney was recognized as one of the world's most influential management thinkers in 2015 and is best known for her work on driving corporate innovation through personal disruption. She's formerly the co-founder of Rose Park Advisors alongside Clayton Christensen, the author of the seminal work on innovation, The Innovator's Dilemma. Previously, Whitney was an institutional investor ranked equity research analyst for eight consecutive years. She's author of the critically acclaimed book, Disrupt Yourself, putting the power of disruptive innovation to work, and Dare, Dream and Do, uh, published in 2012. So welcome to the show, Whitney. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So Whitney, at the core of your book, um, the most recent book you've written, Disrupt Yourself, is the S-curve model of disruption, which has been around for about uh, 50 years, but mostly used for products and markets and not for careers or individually. And I'm curious, what led up to you applying it in this way? It's a great question. Yes, as you said, it, it came. It was developed by Everett M. Rogers in 1962. So we're actually going on 54 years. But um, as you as you mentioned, it's been historically used to help us gauge how quickly an innovation will be adopted. And and in the process of my trying to understand disruption initially as an equity analyst, and then having this insight that companies don't disrupt, people do. Um, I started to think, well, if we're applying the S curve to help us understand innovation, why can't we also help us have it help us understand the psychology of disruption? And so that was really the the sort of beginnings of this notion. And then I realized, okay, so what does this mean then? All right, well, at the low end of the curve, we know that growth is going to be very slow and seemingly non-existent. And if you know that, then that helps you avoid avoid discouragement. You're trying something new, you're starting a new job, you're launching a new product, you're working really, really hard, nothing seems to be happening. But the S-curve tells you that there are going to be time delays. And then it helps you understand, all right, I don't need to be discouraged. This is just part of the process. And then as you move into that sleek, steep back of the S-curve, that's the hyper growth stage where you know you now have momentum, it's working. And that's the place where you feel very, very competent. And with that competent comes competence comes confidence. And then at the top, of the curve, you've started to reach this point of mastery, which we all know is sort of saturation of the market, which is fantastic. But it also means from a personal standpoint, once you've reached that level, your things are very, very easy, but you're no longer enjoying the feel good effects of learning. And if you're not enjoying learning, then boredom and even complacency can kick in, at which point you need to jump to a new curve, because if you don't, your plateau can become a precipice. And so by taking this S-curve and applying it to individuals, it helps us understand the time delays that are involved with any sort of growth or learning and gives us a roadmap for understanding what we might be feeling or thinking as we're trying to take on something new. So, so I mean, that's, you know, within that, you refer, you refer to the kind of the psychology of this. And I think I found this really interesting because, 
you use the concept of jobs to be done um, and the two elements of, you know, the functional job to be done, but also the emotional job to be done. And, and I think this is um, particularly relevant for uh, millennials, for instance, who are uh, maybe in large organizations wondering whether their personal sense of purpose is, a t- is well aligned with their organization's sense of purpose. So, the, the, you know, what, what would you say the, the job to be done is, I mean, how do you character? Can you say a little bit more about the job to be done from an emotional perspective of, of, a, of a career, if you like? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what's interesting about it is is whenever we um, take on a new job, we're actually hiring that. You know, the company is hiring you, but you're hiring it to do a couple of jobs for you. And the first one is obviously the functional job of putting food on the table or, or, or a roof over your head. But the bigger, much, much, much bigger job that oftentimes we don't talk about very much is the emotional job. You're hiring that job to do something for you. It can be for status and prestige. It could be for, for you know, the satisfaction of a job well done, etc. And so what oftentimes happens when you're first starting a new job is that you, you've taken on that new job. It's doing the functional job that you need it to do. You're getting a paycheck every two weeks, but it's not initially doing the emotional job because you're it's hard and you don't know what you're doing yet. And so when you can understand that it's going to take a little while before it can kick in of doing that emotional job of feeling this sense of confidence and competence and enjoyment of your work, it allows you to be a little bit more patient with yourself. And I think that's a really important thing to realize is you're not necessarily bad at it. It's just that you haven't figured out how to do it yet. So, I mean, there's a huge amount in there. But I mean, if we if we think of a, a an individual, I mean, you work with a lot of organizations, um, presumably leadership teams. But if we think of someone um, further down an organization who might be frustrated at the pace at which this, their organization is moving and the, their inability to perhaps, you know, um, move their um, their their idea or their their innovative project forward. I mean, what what advice would you give to to people, I mean, how, how does the job to be done piece play out in that environment? Because I'm just, I'm, I'm really curious as to how, how should an individual think about, you know, think about patience, think about, you know, um, making sure they're well positioned to ride up the curve when the sort of inc- the the compounding effects kick in. Just interested right. in your view on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So what I would say is, you know, oftentimes when you're at the low end of the curve, the question becomes, um, am I at the low end of the curve or am I on the wrong curve, right? Because mm-hmm. you don't know. You can't distinguish between the two. And so I've come up with a number of, of criteria that you can use to determine if you're just on the low end of the curve. And so one of those might be, or not might be, but is, um, are you taking the right kinds of risks? And I, I differentiate in my book between the competitive and the, and the market risk. And the competitive risk is where there might be 10 other people that are trying to do this job and you're competing for resources with them. The market risk is instead you're figuring out how to play where no one else is playing inside of the organization. So that's the first step to helping to ensure that you're um, on just the low end and not the wrong end of the curve. The second thing is that it's really important that you play to not only your strengths, but to your distinctive strengths. And the important piece around the strengths is that oftentimes we try to focus on the things that we've worked really hard to learn how to do and say, this is my strength. But in fact, your strengths are those things that are as natural as breathing for you so much so that you undervalue them and you overvalue what you aren't. And so if you're at the low end of the curve, you're going to be playing to your strengths, not when you're in a bind, but but deliberately. And what I would say is you're bringing your superpowers out to play and you're playing where no one else is playing. The third criteria criterion is, is this hard, but not frustrating. So there's a difference between the two. Sometimes work is just hard because work is hard. But if it's frustrating, there's a lot of things that are going on chemically in your brain that says this may be the wrong curve, because it's just, you just can't get anything done. And the fourth thing is, are you gaining momentum? If you're finding that the, um, the kudos you're receiving from your boss, or the number of leads you're getting or, you know, the traction you're getting in terms of buy-in from people internally is increasing, that momentum is increasing, then you don't have enough information yet to know that you're on the wrong curve and you should keep going. But those are really the four ways that I say, okay, if you're trying to figure out getting buy-in for your ideas inside of an organization, look at those four criteria. If you're meeting all four of them, stay the course, 
Steve Jobs said 50% of the success of all entrepreneurs is simply perseverance. And so at that point, you stay the course until you have enough information to know, oops, it's the wrong curve, time to jump to a new curve. Yeah, because I guess the question, is, the worry is that people, either people um, embark on this journey um, as a reaction to something that's happened to them, or they they don't realize where they are, and you find yourself you know standing on the ladder that's leaning against the wrong wall. But both, but I suppose what you've done is articulate the steps that someone should take to proactively reflect on the journey they're on and whether they actually need to continue or actually to jump onto a different curve. To use your language, exactly. And and the beauty of this is that even if it turns out to be the the wrong curve, like you know you sort of said a rebound job or a rebound girlfriend or boyfriend, you still learn things in the process that can be used to jump to the next curve. You know, just not every curve moves into hyper growth. Again, if you look at the theory of disruption, the odds of success improve, you know, they're six times higher and the revenue opportunity 20 times greater, but that's just going from 6% to 36%. So still 64% of the time, it's going to be the wrong curve, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot that you can be, you know, gained from that wrong curve as you then jump to your next curve. Got it. Got it. So, so I mean, another really strong theme that came out in the book is is around the, the constraints and the fact that constraints are not um, as negative necessarily as, as they should be, but 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 often can be seen as you know if you reframe them, you can actually use them as as enablers. And I I was really very interested in again for the individual trying to let's say. Um, innovate within an established organization where you've got the organizational imperative that is actually creating and maintaining the organization. Um, yet, so one of the big big constraints of an individual in that environment trying to disrupt within an existing organization is, you know, constraint of getting management attention. So I'm interested, right. I mean, what, 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 how, how should people think about that struggling with 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 um, with these constraints of you know co- uh, money resources management attention? What, what what's your thoughts about that? Well, I have two thoughts. The first is is that um, is that a constraint it actually gives you feedback. So the image that that helps me think through this is that of a skateboarder. So skateboarders are considered some of the fastest learners in the world because they receive this really fast or quick and and very useful feedback. And so one of the things that we often find ourselves doing is we feel this constraint, we're bumping up against it and it's really uncomfortable. And yet every time you bump up up against a constraint, whether it's a lack of money, a lack of time, a lack of buy-in, you're getting information and that information can be very, very valuable to you to figure out how can I move up the curve more successfully. So I think that that's one really helpful thing for me when I'm thinking about constraints. The second thing is, is that the importance of inside of an organization, but I would say anywhere is that the importance of battling entitlement, the belief that I exist Therefore, I deserve or I'm entitled. And, um, and this is a sort of emotional entitlement. And I'll, I'll give you a very, you know, simple example, which is a few months ago, I went to the doctor and he told me I was pre-diabetic. And, you know, I should have said, oh, yeah, I'll cut back on sugar. And instead, I just completely threw a tantrum like sugar. It's my only vice. I deserve a cookie. And, um, and realizing that this was me being emotionally entitled. And the same thing happens inside of our organizations. We have these ideas. We think they're brilliant and they should be adopted just because we deserve for them to be adopted. We deserve the cookie. And so the thing that I've learned throughout my career is that whenever you have a brilliant idea, it's important that you understand that when you're inviting people to adopt your brilliant idea, you're asking them to jump to a new curve. And that new curve is your curve. And so we oftentimes do not do the hard work because we're emotionally entitled to get buy-in for the idea, to figure out, who are all our stakeholders? What language do those stakeholders speak? I may speak finance, but my other stakeholder speaks marketing or sales or whatever. And I I need to do the work of translating that idea into a language or the patois that they understand. And I think that while it doesn't mean that all of our ideas will get adopted, I think we are much more likely to get a lot more buy-in if we can understand that sometimes we're emotionally entitled. And if we'll do the hard work of understanding that pushback gives me information, and then once I get that pushback, if I'll translate, I think we would see a lot more success than we do currently. 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this this resonated really with me. Uh, we used to use the language of liberating disciplines in Syngenta. And, uh, you know, just having finished reading the Elon Musk book, because you, you refer to him in, in the um, in the book, the, the, the way in which they tested um, the vehicles in winter conditions, their constraints were so extraordinary that they actually figured out a way of doing this, you know, in a couple of weeks, whereas the industry standard enabled them to do this within, you know, it took them the whole season to do this. And so there are some, some great examples, I guess, of of companies or people who, who understand the, the power of constraints. What do you see? Uh, I mean, Elon Musk is in obviously a huge disruptor and not an incumbent. So both of those things give him a bit of an unfair advantage. But in some of your work, Whitney, with with large incumbent organisations, how how do they take advantage of constraints? Uh, do you do you see any any? Have you got any specific examples of of companies that are really harnessing the power of of the constraint? Yeah, I do. Um, w- one company they think does a, a brilliant job of this is Intuit, the the company that brought us QuickBooks and TurboTax. Um, so. So they've got obviously got a lot of resources that they could throw at innovation. And one example where they didn't is that they wanted to improve the lives of India's 1.2 billion people. You know, that's all. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, of course, they could have thrown a lot of resources at this. But instead, they said, OK, we're going to take three engineers. We're going to send them to rural India for three weeks and just have them figure something out. So that's pretty limited resources. And so these engineers, they go to rural India, they're, you know, sort of trying to figure things out, they get caught in this torrential downpour at a bus stop and start having a conversation with some of the farmers, the local farmers. And they discover that these farmers have really limited access to commodity prices, going back to sort of your your mm-hmm. former world at Syngenta. Again, they could have thrown a lot of resources at this, but they didn't. They just said, all right, well, let's start iterating. Let's start texting, manually texting price and buyer information. Well, after iterating about 12 times, they finally came up with a solution. And the solution now is this sophisticated text message-based platform using these complicated algorithms that help farmers get the best prices. They've got 2 million farmers that are using it and who enjoy this 20% increase in their bottom line, which is the difference between no education and an education for someone's child, all because the engineers were willing to embrace constraints and Intuit was willing to impose the constraints. So I think that's a wonderful example of, of this idea of imposing and embracing constraints. And, and was that, I mean, was that an explicit decision by senior leadership? Was that, you know, was that based on the insight that constraints can be liberating or was that more of a, uh, an accident from which they've learned quite significantly? I I don't know for sure, but my hypothesis would be that this was deliberate. I, I mean, Scott Cook is is very um, very schooled in not only the frameworks of disruption, but also in the frameworks of the lean startup. So I again, I would I would conjecture that it was a deliberate decision made on their part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, related to that, I think Intuit's a public company, isn't it? Correct. Um, I mean, I, I'm curious as to, as you work with large organizations, particularly public ones. I mean, what are you seeing in terms of how, again, let's say, let's take the, an incumbent player in their market, how leadership are balancing the, the, the hyper aggressive and demanding needs of Wall Street for quarterly numbers, but at the same time, you know, thinking through what disruption could come from a new entrant and how to actually ensure the organization remains sustainable longer term. And, and there are loads of industries where this is happening, like finance, like pharma, uh, just, just, you know, the car industry. What, what are you seeing happening? What, what are you seeing the really good execs doing? And what are you seeing some of the problems that, are, that others are still yeah. remaining stuck in, if you like? It, it's a great question. And having been a Wall Street analyst myself, one of those people that was beating the drum <laughs> to hit quarterly numbers is kind of embarrassing, right? You know, game, poacher turned gamekeeper, yep. if you will. Um, you know, I, I, I have a great example of this. I remember when I was covering America Mobile and Carlos Slim, the controlling shareholder of America Mobile, says, we're going to introduce prepaid cards into the United States. And, you know, quarter after quarter after quarter, their numbers were abysmal. We're like, shut down the business. Well, okay, it's a good thing they didn't because now um, their subsidiary here in the United States, TrackPhone, has like 50% of the prepaid market. And I remember another example of um, Jonathan Bush, who's the CEO of Athena Athena Healthcare, where he just said, you know, we're going to grow our top line by 30% per year. But then there were sometimes some hiccups. And I think 
one of the things that's happening is some of the companies that decide that they want to be really innovative are going private, unfortunately. And those that are staying public are saying to themselves, all right, I get this, but I'm in this for the long haul. It may mean that I'm not going to hit my earnings in the near term, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to create value for my shareholders. That takes a real mm. tremendous amount of steel and it, and it requires a, a compensation scheme that rewards the CEO and even sort of the board writ large for being able to stay the course and take the long view. But to manage to the, to the quarter, uh, you can't do it. You just can't. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and there are very few companies. I mean, even just by withdrawing um, quarterly guidance, I mean that that's often <laughs> you know triggers a sell signal on the company, and I, I, it, it takes a very very bold uh, management team to do something like that. It, it really does. Um, so, in that in that environment um, where innovation, nonetheless, is such an important part of of the sustain you know sustaining the. Um, you know, the lifeblood of the company, and assuming that going private isn't an option, what do you see really good leaders actually doing to, um, to create the conditions for this innovation? Well, going back to my, my original thesis is that companies don't disrupt, people do. And the really um, powerful companies are those that develop capabilities before they need them. What I find happening is that people are saying, okay, we know we have this um, imperative to innovate. Um, we also know that people are wanting to bring their dreams to work or else they're not, we're going to lose our top talent. And so people are increasingly, I believe, and I, you know, I've said this, I think 2016 is the year of personal disruption is this understanding that if I will evaluate where my company is on the S curve, well, if I'll evaluate where my team is on the S curve, where, if I will evaluate where, where the individuals on my are on each of the S curve and try to balance for some people at the low end, some people in the sweet spot, some people at the high end. And when people get to the high end, look for opportunities for them to try something new. Then as you have each of the individuals continually enjoying these feel good effects of learning, they are going to come up with ways to disrupt. And so that individual disruption is going to drive the corporate innovation. So, so if I'm a leader of a team in an organization, uh, it could be an executive team, it could be, um, you know, a sales team. I mean, what, what does that mean? Uh, what do I, what should I, what's a new, is there an emerging leadership model? Are there a new set of behaviors that the leader needs to demonstrate to have these conversations? Because, you know, yeah. f- five years ago, you know, it's unlike, I guess it's unlikely that you might have said that, you know, use the language people need to bring their dreams to work or people probably wouldn't have listened to you perhaps then as much as they are now. Right. Well, and, 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 and that's partly, I mean, we partly have demographics to thank for that, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, this huge cohort of millennials who are saying, <laughs> if I can't, then I won't, right? I won't come. Um, so what I'm finding is that, you know, as I, as I work, through, work with, through large corporations, I'm finding that they'll say to themselves, you know, I'll go through these frameworks and I'll ask people the question, who's at the top of their learning curve? And people will raise their hands. And then I'll turn to, you know, one of the, the C-suite executives and say, did you see that? You need to have a conversation with them. And so basically making it okay to say, you know what, I'm ready to try something new. And if someone's at the top of the curve and they're like, oh, I'm a little comfortable, I'm a little afraid to try something new, the, a leader will say to that person, you need a new stretch assignment. Mm. And it's time for you to try something new because we need to unleash you and you're not getting unleashed here. And so as you allow that person to move into a stretch assignment, then the people who are in the sweet spot can sort of move into the leadership role on the team of being the experts. And then it becomes a sick, there's a cyclicality to it that allows people to continually be, you know, jumping, riding the wave, you know, coming off the wave, Mm -hmm. starting a new wave, et cetera. And we all know that the only companies that are going to remain competitive are those that can ride the waves of of disruption rather than just coping with those waves. So, so this is really, you, 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 you're moving towards a question, which I, which I was going to ask earlier and I didn't, but um, the wave now, you know, I'm not a surfer, but I know um, that you don't always catch the surf, uh, the wave correctly, and it can end up pretty nastily. So the, the reason I use that analogy is, you know, often these stretches, well, sometimes these stretch assignments don't work and an individual will, will fail or a team will fail. This is really hard in public companies um, or in any large hierarchical organization because failure is something that's not often talked about. How, how do you, what do you see the really good leaders again? How do they think about failure? Mm. And 
And I'm not, not not so much talking about failure, but actually, what do they do what about do they failure? Do? Yeah. Right. So, so I think the really good leaders say to themselves, "All right, um, I'm going to have some. I'm going to push my people, and if my people are working really, really hard." then this failure is something that I ask them to do. And I'm going to say to them, you know, you need to get yourself on the beach, get your surfboard and get back in and get into another wave. And the fact that it didn't work is okay because it means you were pushing yourself to, to your limits. Um, and I think that like you just alluded to is that we oftentimes say we celebrate failure, but that's usually code for um, celebrate my failures. I'll think about celebrating yours. And so an actual leader will will create situations where their people have real stretch assignments. And if those people are high quality, fully engaged people, when it doesn't work, they'll say, what didn't work, let's figure out what you're going to do next. Again, that takes a lot of guts. But people know how to do it because they do it with their children all yeah. the time. And most people do have children. And so it's it's a skill set that we do have, but it's something that we we need to foster, I think, much, much more inside of a corporate environment. Yeah, we we leave it behind often when we get to work. But I think I think the other thing that's, that resonates for me is that the leader themselves needs to admit that they've failed, and that's very very hard for people to do. You know, once they think they've got to the executive suite, that you know that that's um, because of the, their wonderfully successful career. Without actually, well, they they conveniently forget their failures sometimes. I notice. Well, but I think Mark, I think it's hard for us to do because um, we're we're reared, and I talk a little bit about this in the book that we. Um, we conflate our our sense of self, like our the, the essence of our being with, with what happens. And if we can learn to separate those two things out and say, okay, I tried something, it didn't work, but this actually has nothing to do. This is not a referendum on me yeah. and my worth. And when we can we can separate those two out, and and the best leaders have separated them out. Like you'll ask them, well, like, well, did you feel embarrassed when this happened? And they're like, no, I tried it and it didn't work. And so if you can have if you can find more people that don't have shame around failure, those people are going to go a long ways in your organization. Yeah, I mean, and, and you touched, Whitney, I mean, I'll make it explicit because it's, it is implicit throughout the book. I mean, the book is based on developing a, self, a level of self-awareness, which is which is somewhat rare in uh, in the in the workplace, and I think um, you know you're 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 shining a light on that. And of course, once you become self-aware, you can't become unaware, and that is one of the build. <laughs> that's one of the building blocks of this whole process, I think. That's right. And I, I'm glad that you, uh, no one's ever quite described it that way. So uh, I love that you sort of became aware of it and described it that way. That's lovely. So um, the, the, let's just talk about the model at the organizational level, because um, we started by saying how you, tr- you, know, you, you brought the model from product into self. Now, from self to organization, what does, you know, sitting down with a chief executive or a leader of a R&D function, for instance, I mean, how, how would you suggest, what kind of conversation would you have with them if the model was sitting between you about helping them um, innovate and sustain innovation in their company? Yeah. So going going back to my original premise is that the fundamental unit of disruption is the individual. What I find is that as I sit down with a, a, a CEO and say, okay, here's my view and let's present these frameworks to your executive team. And then as I present the frameworks, go through each of the seven variables that I talk about as accelerants al- along the S curve. As we open up these conversations, um, and people start thinking about it. Okay, so how am I taking on market versus competitive risk, both for my team, with my products, for me as an individual? And am I really playing to my strengths? And in what ways am I actually entitled? Because that's one of the big ahas that people have is they realize, oh, I thought it was just millennials that were entitled. Then they realize, <laughs> oh, I'm entitled too, because the research says is the more successful we are, the more we think we deserve our success. So the more senior you get, the more entitled you get. And so what ends up happening is as you have this conversation, all of the, there's a lot of brilliance and a lot of ideas that are just residing in the brains and the hearts of the key management. And so this notion of personal disruption allows you to sort of kind of break out the crustiness and the gridlock that's happening so that those ideas can kind of float to the top and actually get executed on. Huh, yeah, well, it's, I mean, it must, and, and you know, when, once you've, you know, created that frame or reframe the situation in terms of next steps, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the book, which while it works at the individual level, clearly would work um, at the, at the organizational level as well then. 
They do. And it's really exciting to see is when people have those ahas and in and, and, and a setting that allows for these conversations across silos, you start realizing, you know, it may be as simple as, oh, I wasn't getting buy-in from idea from, you know, X, Y, and Z person. Now let's have that conversation. And, and it, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to do, but it's very simple as well. Yeah, yeah. It's simple, but not necessarily, as you say, not necessarily easy to do. Simple on the other side of complexity, as as I think Albert Einstein said. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, beginning to wrap this up, I mean, you've, you've obviously, um, you know, you've gone from, you know, um, a top ranked Wall Street analyst to running money on the other side of the uh, the other side of the uh, the table to actually you know becoming an entrepreneur and an author. Um, so you've obviously this you know you're practicing what you preach. This has been to use your language something of I guess something of a discovery driven career. Um, so how, how important is curiosity, and more importantly, you know where do you go to to keep fresh and stimulated and and continuing to discover you know to push the the uh, the shores of your knowledge if you like. Mm. Great question. Um, a couple places. Number one is I go, <laughs> you're going to laugh. Um, I go to my own personal experience and the, the experiences that I'm having and trying to be a mother and a wife and a friend. I mean, there's so much sort of in my individual interactions with people on a daily mm-hmm. basis, you know, the sort of introspection thing, there's so much fodder for growth in that respect. And I think the other thing that I do is I try to sort of eat my own cooking when it kind of, which is kind of funny that I'm saying that because I don't cook anything other than chocolate chip cookies, but mm-hmm. I try to eat my own cooking and this in the way of opening up my network and reading lots of different authors and ideas and people. And, you know, like right now, I'm, I, I've just finished reading a book called um, On Combat, which is about people in the military and how they deal with, you know, killing and what that looks like. And that's been really, really fascinating for me, something that I would never experience myself. And so just always trying to find ideas from lots of different places and stories. And anytime I talk to a person like, what's your story? And trying to just figure out how all these different pieces come together. That's, I think, the way that I most try to keep myself fresh and up to date. Okay. No, I, and um, it's not a book I've read. Who's, who's the author of On Combat? Oh, you know what? Here's, uh, I'll look it up. Keep talking to me and I'll tell you. I have it on my Kindle. And when you have something on your Kindle, I think it's, d- just keep going and I'll tell you in just a second. Yeah, I must say, I, I listened to your book on the, um, when I was running and it was great because, you know, I like to do two or three things at the same time. But when I came to actually, you know, start developing a precy and preparing for this conversation, I found it absolutely really frustrating because a book you can actually flick through very quickly, but you can't do that on a, on an audio at all, which is a shame. Exactly. Oh, oh, so here's who it's called on combat and it's by Dave Grossman and okay. Lauren Christensen. It's excellent. Okay, super. We'll shove that in the show notes. So, um, before I come to the, the last three questions, which I sent out to you in advance, um, what's next for you, Whitney? Mm. So I'm working on my next book, um, and I'm sure you're not going to be surprised at all to discover that I've had a lot of people say to me, okay, so fantastic. Um, now I know how to disrupt myself, but how do I help someone else disrupt, um, whether inside of an organization um, or otherwise? So I'm working on that book right now, and I, it's it's really interesting, and I'm excited about it. And My goal is to have something out in 2017. How's that for aggressive? Fantastic. So is that the beginning or the end of 2017? <laughs> uh, probably the end. Okay. But I mean, you know, without going, I mean, so it's obviously, you know, in work in progress, but I, can you say a little bit more about, um, you know, when you say helping others, is it more of a, a coaching book? Is it more of a business book? I'm just interested. It's more in- of a business book. Mm-hmm. So, so again, this idea of, you know, people are responding to this as, as, okay, here's what I do for myself. And oftentimes they think for my career, but then as I go into companies, they're like, okay, so what does this really look like? How do I do this if I'm a manager? How do I do if this uh, if I'm um, running a team? What does this look like? How do I create the conditions wherein I can help people disrupt and then in so doing drive innovation? So just taking it, sort of looking at the other side of the coin of this. And and disrupt is is will that remain the magic word? Or I mean, because I'm also thinking, I mean, disruption. You know, there is this sort of breathlessness coming from Uber and Google and the West Coast Silicon Valley. For you know, I'm sitting here in Switzerland, as you know. I mean, there's a a lot of you know um, long established companies like Nestle, like Novartis, like Syngenta, for which disruption 
um, might not necessarily be a reality. It's more of a sustaining innovation sort of energy they have. So I'm just curious whether you, you know, does it, does your, will your, the subject matter um, focus on the, uh, you know, the industrial long product life cycle companies that might well be around for many years to come as irrespective of oh, what absolutely. goes on the West Coast? Absolutely. Because, I mean, if you think about it, um, this whole idea of if you're driving innovation through, I mean, let me give come back to one example. I was in a very large corporation. It's like a Fortune 50. And I asked the question, once we identified what their sort of superpowers, their distinctive strengths were, I said, how many of you are using those strengths every day at work? 5% raised their hands. <laughs> can you imagine in a company like a Nestle, if no. you can get that even up to 20%, what gets unleashed in terms of innovation and creativity in that organization? It would be, and it's not, that, that drives not to just sustaining innovation, that drives to real disruption and the courage to come up with these interesting ideas and test them and and iterate against them and just see where the organization goes next. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, if, I mean, so this this sounds like a fascinating, um, you know, addition to the to the management thinking in this area, because it does feel, you know, what you've done with this book, because I'm sure, I mean, you've, you've wove, it's a, it's a very much a sort of a polymaths book, because you've, you've, you've woven in the disciplines of neuroscience, of behavioral finance, of, you know, hardcore, you know, um, business management thinking, but also, uh, I mean, it's, it's, from that point of view, it's a very, very rich book because it puts the individual right at the heart of the story, which I think is is quite sort of liberating and also very relevant, of course, for the millennials that you talked about earlier on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, so brilliant. So, Whitney, three last questions. Um, first one is, um, what are your morning rituals? <laughs> so... Um, I recently read this book not too long ago called The 5 A.M. Miracle. And um, I used to always get up when I was in high school and college at like 6 a.m. or earlier to practice the piano for three hours a day. And so I'm trying to like reinstitute that. And so my morning rituals when I first get up are to try not to check my email immediately if I'm being completely honest <laughs> um, and to do something that's sort of inward facing, whether it's reading, reading scriptures or, you know, just reading something that helps me kind of, however someone wants to describe it, get in touch with our essence or get in touch with God and just kind of ground and center myself. And then the second thing I do is the hardest thing that I have to do for the day, I do that first. Mm -hmm. If it's like working on a speech, prepping a speech, writing something that's really tough, I try to get that done by eight or nine because if I do, then the rest of the day goes really well. If I don't, mm, not so much. Okay, brilliant. Second question, what have you changed your mind about recently? Um, well, I alluded to it earlier, this whole cookie and sugar thing, which has been kind of a really big deal for me. And I've changed my mind about that recently, where I made the decision and in part on the back of a daughter who was prodding me that I am not eating any sugar, um, any cookies, candy, cake or Diet Coke for all of 2016. And I've changed my mind because a year ago, I would never have done that. And it's been really important in not, in, not only in terms of yeah, I've lost a few pounds, but in terms of my productivity, in terms of my mood swings, it's just been quite a, a liberating experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating how a minor change, you know, at an objective level like that can actually you know, can be a game changer or can be a multiplier in terms of freeing up all sorts of other other resources that you weren't aware were being constrained in the first place. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I had written a piece called How Sugar's Holding You Back at Work as kind of a warm up. And it's, it's really, it's astonishing, actually. And a third question, what advice would you have for your 25 year old self? Yeah, um, two pieces, I would say. The first is to just not be so scared. Um, just, you know, I, I just feel like when I was 25, I was so scared of so many things and I would battle through the fear and, and just to just know it's going to be okay. And I think part of the reason that I think I have, you know, if it's scary and lonely, you're on the right track, you know, because a disruptor by de definition is playing where no one else is playing. I think if I had known that, like, it's supposed to be a little bit scary and it's supposed to be a little bit lonely because that means you're, you're forging your own path. I wish I would have known that or could give myself that advice. And the second thing I would say, and I guess I really actually did follow this advice, is that um, if you don't, in the absence of knowing what to do, just take the thing, the job, the opportunity that will open more doors, not less once you're finished. Because when you're in your 20s and even your 30s, you're very much at the low end of your life's curve and you want to be opening up possibilities. And so you take 
the possibilities, all other things being equal that are going to open more doors, not less. Yeah, wonderful. And it's, it's really interesting because everyone answers that question differently, but most people tend to say the same thing at the end in the final analysis, <laughs> which is re- which is really interesting. Um, and well, I what, just what's the thing they say? Don't well, be afraid. Yeah, don't don't be afraid. Go for it. Um, you know, there's there's the the world is a rich place where, and, and it's really just getting into the game. It's partly the Steve Jobs or the um, the Woody Allen thing. Life is eighty percent of life is showing up. Um, but it, but well, it, could, it could also be that the people you know might be who we're talking to are at a, a certain level in their or stage in their lives, and that's you know we're we're probably harking back to um, to what it was like back then and how the, how 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 different the world felt. Yeah, I, you know, you just said something that made me think of something else, and I don't know that I would give myself this advice because I followed it. But um, to the extent that you decide to get married, marry well. Mm. I've seen a lot of people in their forties and fifties who are now sort of reaping the fruits of having not chosen a a good, you know, good life partner. And I think that that's it's such a, you know, we talk about making good business decisions. That's like the best business decision. You you know, the most important business decision you make is like who you decide to marry. Yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, where can people get in touch with you, Whitney? Well, I have a website, WhitneyJohnson.com. I have a newsletter that I send out twice weekly, or not twice weekly. Wow, that would be intense. <laughs> twice a month. Um, and so if you're interested, you could just email me at Whitney at WhitneyJohnson.com and I'll sign you up. Um, and then you can follow me either on Twitter at Johnson Whitney or on LinkedIn. Super. And we'll put all of those uh, those links into the show notes. So Whitney, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show. I'm sure our audience enjoyed it as much as I did. And thanks very much for your time today. Thank you. It, it has been a pleasure. So thanks for listening. Some really great practical tips you can use straight away as you think about your career, the kinds of projects you work on, and how you want to move your business forward. And it's worth remembering that Whitney has got um, great experience, firstly as an analyst working on Wall Street, and then more recently, she's been sitting on the other side of the table next to Clayton Christensen as they set up and ran their own fund. And so a lot of her work is based on practical experience of what actually works in the trenches. For example, I love the way she takes marketing concepts like the S-curve of disruption and the job to be done and actually applies them to the individual in the workplace. I think this is really powerful. But of course, knowledge is not necessarily power. It's only potential power. And it's all about execution, taking some action towards your goals. So I urge you to get the book and to start applying some of these concepts straight away. And alternatively, and what many of our listeners have said that they do, is you can download the transcript and we produce a transcript for each interview and use this. So go ahead and and download the transcript from www.innovationecosystem.com forward slash number 1313. And once you've got downloaded it, you can print it off, you can review the conversation, highlight sections of interest, scribble in the margins, and share it with your team and your colleagues. And if you prefer pictures to words, then just look at the visuals, because we produce a set of visuals for each episode as well, and for the preceding 12 episodes that have gone gone before this one in the series. Now, next week, Roddy talks to Shane O'Mara about applied neuroscience, and that promises to be a really interesting talk. If you like this episode, please do go to iTunes and write a review. These shows take time and energy to make, and we really would like to hear from you and to get our work out into the innovation ecosystem for executives and entrepreneurs to benefit from. Thanks again for your time and have a great week.